start thinking about intelligibility versus volume on a vocal. It's a good mindset to have. This vocal isn't intelligible enough and you go to turn it up and you're like, hmm, it still feels like it's buried by the music and then you turn it up a little bit more and then all of a sudden you're like, hmm, now it's just too much vocal. Effects can be your best friend here. Welcome to Kush After Hours. My name is Gregory Scott. Tonight, part two of three of Rules I Break Every Time I Mix. If you saw the first part, you know what this series is about. Rule number two goes something like this. You need to start with the vocal because everything else has to work around. You want to keep it clear. And I think in competing, it's the most important. Maybe you can make that work. Sometimes I've been able to make that work. And by sometimes, I think maybe twice in my entire freaking life. That's not how I mix. This is what I do. I will mix my music to be an instrumental. I don't even bother with the vocals at all for a long time because for me the music I want it to tell a story and I want it to feel a certain way and I want all the dynamics in play and I want the balances that make me feel the right things at the right time and the energy and the support and whatnot so I will get a mix probably like 60 70 percent done before I even pull up the vocal and then I generally work to kind of shoehorn the vocal into my instrumental that's kind of backwards from how a lot of people will advise you to work. Who cares, right? Do it your way. Find what works for you. It may be the case that you need to have your vocal in initially or early on, and everything is subjugated to that vocal. Nothing is allowed to encroach on or get in its way or what, unless you got this vocal tone, and then you're putting these things in, and if something goes like this, you're like, hey, 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 and you slice that off. That's a great way to work, apparently, for some people. Not for this guy right here. I'm extremely confident now at this point in time that what works for me is mixing an instrumental and then carving and shaping and slicing and notching and boosting and compressing and distorting and tucking and paralleling all the things that we need to do to make a vocal fit into a mix. I do that towards the end. The cool thing about that is that I can mute out my vocals and print the mix and I've got a banging instrumental track. So it's just like zero work there for me to get the instrumental versions of my songs as well as the vocal versions. So a few heads up, if you haven't worked this way in the past, is you do your instrumental, right? Try to park like 3% of your brain to remember there is a vocal that's gonna need to go in there. So don't clutter up your mid range completely, right? Try to leave a little bit of space and good spaces for vocals like 2.5K, Almost any vocal from almost any singer singing in almost any range, if you leave a little bit of 2.5 open and you let the vocal kind of sing through there, man, because that is, that's what our ears are the most sensitive to by far is 2 to 2.5, 3K, because that's like, if you think about it evolutionarily, that is the most piercing frequency when a human being is yelling or screaming like a baby or a tribe member who needs help or people that are way off in the distance and trying to give you important information. You need to hear that frequency more than anything else. So we do. I find it to be an incredibly grating frequency. Nevertheless, it's got to be in there for clarity and intelligibility and presence on a vocal. So anyway, things to keep in mind. Mixing your instrumental, leave a little bit in that mid-range space somewhere. I don't know where. You'll figure it out. Another good space for a vocal that I like is like that 600 to 800 hertz. 600 a lot of times for the drums is a great frequency to like just bring a little 600 up on your drum bus. And then the vocals closer to 800. 800 on a vocal, man, this is probably rule number four that I'm breaking, but like so many people think of 800 hertz as a frequency to be cutting. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it's such a lovely frequency to boost, especially on a vocal. It's a beautiful kind of old school mid-range. It's like really where the telephonic mid-range begins for me. And so it gives you, as you push 800 hertz, it will push a vocal towards you and it will give you some of that uh, sort of evolutionary, I can hear the voice really clearly frequency, but it's very low. It's like almost in the warmth zone. So you can just, even just like a dB on a vocal, that's kind of like, you're like, eh, it's kind of working, but I'm gonna, Throw a little 800 hertz into that vocal and it gives it kind of an old school mid-range like i don't know i associate like me everybody's like the sound of neve i love neve neve's kind of got that papery 800 hertz 
vibe going on. You like it? You don't like it? It's really it's handy. So, rule number two, vocal goes in last, and I am just slicing and dicing. So save a little space for it. Other things that you got to figure out how to do is when you're trying to get that vocal to sit in there early on, one of the things you're going to have to play with is your effects. If you find that you've got a vocal that's doing that thing where you're like, all right, it's not loud enough, it's not intelligible enough, start thinking about intelligibility versus volume on a vocal. It's a good mindset to have. This vocal isn't intelligible enough, and you go to turn it up, and you're like, hmm, it still feels like it's buried by the music, and then you turn it up a little bit more, and then all of a sudden you're like, hmm, now it's just too much vocal. Even if it is or isn't intelligible, you can just sense this is too much vocal. Effects can be your best friend here, as can 5K. Mm. Pull up a Clarifonic. If you don't have a Clarifonic, you should. People use it on their mix, but man, on a vocal, go to the clarity band, the presence. Turn off the focus band and just grab the presence and just goose that up a little bit. It's got such an amazing thing for a vocal to just, it doesn't make the vocal louder, it does, all it does is just makes it clearer. It just kind of like brings it up and over the mix to your ears without like pulling the bottom forward and swamping the mix. So that's a good trick on the vocal. Anyway, back to effects. If you got that vocal where you're like, it's too quiet, it's too quiet, and then suddenly it's too loud. Delays and reverbs. One of my favorite things on vocals is a quarter note delay. I think probably 100% of my vocals have a quarter note delay stereo spread by opening the timing up. So I've got a quarter note over here and a quarter note plus 5, 10, 15, 20 milliseconds or minus 5, 10, 20. The point is there's a slight time delta between the two, but they're pretty much quarter note delays. I have them panned out somewhere off the of center. Sometimes it's here and sometimes it's all the way out. The thing about this delay for me is it's dark. I low pass it and I mean like I'm going low. 600 hertz is the general zone for me. This is a, a warmth, wet kind of gluing thing on a vocal. So if you get this delay, stereo, not ping-ponging because they're both almost the same time, but they have a width, they're separated by time, they're panned out, and they're low pass like a mofo, 600 hertz. And you just kind of like, you just nudge that up a little bit, a little bit. At some point, when you start to hear it, it's probably starting to get too loud, but you'll notice that a quarter note dark delay in stereo is such an amazing vocal glue. It's one of my go-tos. Half the time, my vocals have zero reverb on them at all, but they always, always have this delay on them. And sometimes they have other delays too. Often they have other delays as well. But that's just my stock generic glue. You'll find that you can get a vocal that's not quite loud enough, and then you turn the effects up on that vocal, and it just becomes more intelligible. One of the main problems with getting a vocal intelligible and sitting in a mix is that it's not taking up enough of the right kinds of spaces. Most of the time in the real world, we speak, we hear others speak. We're in acoustic environments. We hear ambiences, we hear reflections. We probably aren't conscious of them because the brain is really good at bringing all that information together and presenting it to our consciousness as a single unified package. So we hear one sound, but in reality, you are generally hearing as much or more reflected sound on a human voice. And again, evolutionarily, we are, our brains are just so wired to key into every aspect of the human voice. It's how we communicate, it's how we stay safe, it's how we get our needs met, it's how we have the relationships that we do. All, it's everything comes down to human relationships for us. And in order to be able to communicate for the vast majority of us, that means spoken language, and that means understanding and hearing the other person, reading their emotional states, understanding the things that aren't said underneath with tone of voice and stuff like that. Anyway, the idea is we are incredibly sensitive to all aspects of perceiving the human voice. And so when we go into an artificial environment like uh, music production, and we have a voice that's just kind of sitting there, and it doesn't have any effects on it at all. It doesn't have anything spreading it in this direction. It doesn't have anything spreading it in this direction. Even though it might technically be like everywhere it needs to be and everything that it needs to be, we're going to have trouble with intelligibility because we're not getting the other kinds of cues that we're used to. Now, this isn't always the case. You can mix a bone dry vocal, but even then, usually the microphone and the space that you're in, you're hearing some sort of an environment, even if it's not obvious what it is. A booth has a sound. That's why if you go to 
Alterverb or the Impulse Reverb collection of your choice, you will find, as part of these stock collections usually, very small spaces. Cars, bathrooms, closets, things like this. It's interesting to listen to these things at 100% wet just to hear what is the sound of a closet minus the voice. Right? It's, it sounds mostly like a voice, but there's a boxiness, there's a woodiness, there's a muffled quality to it. In a mix, it's generally helpful, generally helpful to have some sort of a context. And so, because so many vocals are recorded so dry, like artificially weirdly dry, you got to augment. You got to match the spaces going around it. So think about it. if you have a guitar with a bunch of delays and reverb on it, and you have a drum kit that's got a big snare with a room sound on the snare, and then you plop this bone dry vocal in. Maybe you can get it to work, and maybe that's what the production needs. But if you're having trouble seating that vocal, probably comes down to the effects. The right kinds of effects in the right amounts. It's not really about volume for the voice in terms of being able to understand what the singer's saying. It's about getting the ambience is right. For my money, it's almost always a quarter note dark delay in stereo. For reverbs, all bets are off with the human voice. Sometimes you need a couple of reverbs. Generally speaking, the subtler the better. Unless you want to hear and feel the reverb as its own effect, you can do that. But whatever you're doing, try this out. Take your vocal and take your reverb return. So you're sending the vocal to the reverb and you have 100% wet reverb coming in on its own channel. And then put that vocal to where it gets that tipping point where you're like, okay, here it's too quiet. Oh, and here it's just too loud. Pull it back down, bring up the reverb until you can just start to hear it. And then more reverb, less voice. And maybe you got a, even more reverb and a little bit less voice. And then try to see how far you can tip the balance inversely. Don't be worried about whether it sounds good or fits the production. Just get a sense for like, okay, Interesting. I can really push the wetness of this vocal way into the background. This will be the background for me. For you, you really push that vocal like this into the back. And when you do that, you have this huge wet tank of a voice back there. You can have this little tiny dry voice in the middle just being like, hello, I'm here saying things. And you can understand it. Right? It might feel too distant, too hollow, too echoic. The whole song might be swamping out. You lose the intelligibility of the other instruments at that point in time. But that's not the point here. The point here is you just understand the push and pull of effects versus dry signals, especially on the human voice, and how that relates to intelligibility and your ability to push a vocal down into a mix, but keep the intelligibility and the clarity. And then it becomes a balancing act using your taste, the aesthetics, the flavors of reverb you're chosen. There's a lot of factors there. I could go on and on and on about these kinds of things, but these are the sorts of things that you need to have a handle on and that you're going to need to play with even more aggressively when you mix instrumentally and then have to work to fit a vocal in because it's not just going to be about frequency space. It's going to be about the emotion, vibe, context, marrying the sort of ambience and wetness factor and vibe of the voice to the rest of the music. Delays are different than reverbs, they serve the similar purposes, but they get there very differently. I usually do a combo. The point is here, I put that vocal in at the end of the game. Shoehorn it in, make it work, feels good, print it, mute the vocal out, print the instrumental. Hmm. Kush after hours. Gregory Scott, thanks for listening.